Pato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namatasa Bodo Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namatasa Bodo Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So we're going to jump right in. If you come in late, it's fine. Just um, we're going to go mostly on the share screen. So I'm going to get right to it. So now today's lesson is basically that what this is. Um, we're calling it the crossroad of mundane and transcendental dependent origination. So if your title's different, uh, Gavesi, let's make sure we send this one in. I'll send it to you after this is over, okay? Okay, I think uh, uh, the file you sent me, I shared just now. Okay. Now, yeah, well, this, I don't know if this name is on the top, but we, I changed it. <laughs> okay. So okay. this is basically an appeal that I'm putting out for this booklet. It's never been, never found its printer to date, which is July, 2022. Originally, this was put together in 2013 and was re-edited in 2015. So many have said it deserves to be printed and I'm hoping that we'll get help to do this. So here are some beginning questions before we start the class. Did the Buddha, hypothesize, meaning did he experience the three links or think of the three links in dependent origination before seeing them? And some people say no, but I really feel he did because of the way that the, this, is, this is written and you'll see as we go along. When we review these links, can we discover how suffering can cease? How can emotional reactions and poor behavior patterns change? Was a progressive development chart left for us to repeat to find relief? And if we read through the Upanisa Sutta, which this is about all about also, you have to have the background and go through the dependent origination to understand the Upanisa Sutta. So if we read through the Upanisa Sutta, will we learn dependent origination to its ultimate end? The answer to these is yes. The idea here is to see how the Bodhisattva before his enlightenment uncovered the 12 links of human cognition 2,500 years ago or more and realized how cessation of suffering can work and how you as a student today can see and understand this as you practice what he discovered in the same way. So the material that um, we cover for this discussion is taken directly out of the Sutta text and any changed words were carefully chosen, simpler word replacements or synonyms that will bring you closer to the correct understanding. And so you can see this too. And these words, I have tried to go back in and bracket all of those that were, uh, we took a simpler word that was more commonly understood by the students, students, I'm sorry, by the students. And this is common practice when we're trying to teach generation to generation. So there are two suttas here that clearly reveal how Siddhartha the Bodhisattva investigated suffering, the first noble truth, the cause of suffering, which was the second noble truth, and how to experience the cessation of suffering, the third noble truth. And this has re revealed the actuality or the true nature of everything. Now, the Samyutta Nikaya, as translated by Bhikkhu Bodhi, is the book we use, which also along with the uh, Majima Nikaya. And these are published by Wisdom Publications. This Nidana Vaga, the Book of Causation, Sutta 10, number 10 and bracketed 10, Gotama the Great Sakyan Sage is the title. You can go to your Samyutta Nikaya book if you have it and starts page 537 through 539. 
Now the Samyutta Nikaya, the book of causation 1010, it starts out this way. They broke down the sutta into two pieces and the first one is called origination. So here is what tells you exactly the Buddha telling you exactly when this happened. Monks, before my enlightenment, while I was still a bodhisattva, not yet fully enlightened, it occurred to me, alas, this world has fallen into trouble, that in that it is born, it ages and died. It passes away and is reborn, and yet it does not understand the escape from this suffering headed by aging and death. When now will an escape be discerned from this suffering headed by aging and death? Then must it occur to me when what exists does aging and death come to be? By what is aging and death conditioned? And then monks through careful attention, there took place in me a break by wisdom. When there is birth, aging and death comes to be. Aging and death has birth as its condition. Then monks, it occurred to me. When what exists does birth come to be? By what is birth conditioned? And then monks, to careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there are habitual tendencies, birth comes to be. Birth has habitual tendencies as its condition. Then, monks, it occurred to me, what, when what exists, do habitual tendencies come to be? By what are habitual tendencies conditioned? Then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is clinging, habitual tendencies come to be. Habitual tendencies have clinging as their condition. So we see this is very methodically his meditation investigation step by step. Now, then monks, it occurred to me, when what exists does clinging come to be? And by what is I missed one minute, no, I'm sorry, just jumped. By what is clinging condition? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is craving, clinging comes to be. Clinging has craving as condition. Then monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, does craving come to be? By what is craving conditioned? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is feeling, craving comes to be. Craving has feeling as its condition. Then monks, it occurred to me, when what exists does feeling come to be? By what is feeling conditioned? And then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is contact, feeling comes to be. Feeling has contact as its condition. And then monks, it occurred to me, when what exists does contact come to be? By what is contact conditioned? And then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there are six sense bases, contact comes to be. Contact has six sense bases as its condition. Then monks, it occurred to me, when what exists do six sense bases come to be? By what are the six sense bases conditioned? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is mentality, materiality, the six sense bases come to be. The six sense bases have mentality, materiality as their condition. We must have both the physical, material ear 
and we must have the mental process inside that helps the ear to operate. We must have the physical eye that's operating, and then we must have the mental part of vision optical system working. Then monks, it occurred to me when what exists, does the mentality materiality come to be? By what is mentality materiality conditioned? And then monks through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is consciousness, mentality materiality comes to be. Mentality materiality has consciousness as its condition. And then monks, it occurred to me, when what exists, does consciousness come to be? By what is consciousness conditioned? Then monks through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there are volitional formations, consciousness comes to be. Consciousness has volitional formations as its condition. And we will talk about volitional formations a little bit down the road, I think, in this. But we don't usually use volitional because it means choice. And we don't feel there's anyone there to make a choice at that point in the development of the human cognition. So what somebody else said, and we picked up on it, was to use the word preparations here. When there are preparations, then consciousness comes to be. Consciousness has preparations that, that as its condition. And these preparations come up so that consciousness can then exist inside the being. And that's pretty good, I think. And uh, Bhante also, Bhante Vimala Ramsey thought that was pretty good too. I think Delson even picked up on that too. So then monks, it occurred to me, when what exists do preparations come to be? By what are the preparations conditioned? Well, then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is ignorance, preparations come to be. Preparations have ignorance as their condition. When you're ignorant, ignoring this whole system, this process of dependent and origination, or this process of human cognition, nothing can come to be. Well, the formations come to be. I said that wrong. When you're ignoring it, the formations come to be. I'm sorry. Uh, but if you understand the knowledge of how it's working, then these formations can slow down and stop coming to be. Thus, with ignorance as condition, for volitional formations come to be. With volitional formations as condition, consciousness comes to be. With consciousness as condition, mentality, materiality comes to be. With mental, with with consciousness, as, with mentality, I'm sorry. Ugh. With mentality, materiality comes to be. With mentality, materiality as condition, the sixth sense basis come to be. With the sixth sense basis as condition, contact comes to be. With contact as condition, feeling comes to be. With feeling as condition, craving comes to be. With craving as condition, clinging comes to be. With clinging as condition, habitual tendencies come to be. With habitual tendencies as condition, birth comes to be. With birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair come to be. Origination. Origination. Thus, monks, in regard to things unheard before, there arose in me vision and knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge and light. He was contemplating this. He was working it out one piece at a time first before ever seeing it. The second part covers how the third noble truth, which stated that there is a cessation of suffering, came to be by demonstrating how cessation of suffering operates. And so the sutta was actually divided in two pieces of the origination and the second part, cessation on page 539. 
Then monks, it occurred to me when what does not exist does aging and death not come to be. With the cessation of what does the, the cessation of aging and death come about? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is no birth, aging and death does not come to be. And with the cessation of birth comes cessation of aging and death. Then, monks, it occurred to me, when what does not exist, oh boy, what happened here? <laughs> Let's see. Hmm. When what does not exist, does birth not come to be? By the cessation of what does the cessation of birth come about? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there are no habitual tendencies, birth does not come to be. With the cessation of habitual tendencies, the cessation of birth. Then monks, it occurred to me, when what does not exist, do habitual tendencies not come to be? By the cessation of what? Do the cessation of habitual tendencies come about? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is no clinging, habitual tendencies do not come to be. And with the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of habitual tendencies. Then monks, it occurred to me, when what does not exist, does clinging not come to be? By the cessation of what, does cessation of clinging come about? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me, a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is no craving, clinging does not come to be. With the cessation of craving comes the cessation of clinging. And then, monks, it occurred to me, when what does not exist, does craving not come to be? By the cessation of what does not, the cessation of craving come about. Then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is no feeling, craving does not come to be. With cessation of feeling comes the cessation of craving. When monks, it occurred to me, when what does not exist, does feeling not come to be? By the cessation of what does feeling not come to be? Then monks do careful attention that took place the breakthrough in, in, by wisdom. When there is no contact, feeling does not come to be. With the cessation of contact comes the cessation of feeling. Then monks, it occurred to me, when what does not exist, does contact not come to be? By the cessation of what does not does the cessation of contact come about? Then monks through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there are no six sense bases, contact does not come to be. And with the cessation of the six sense bases comes the cessation of contact. Then monks, it occurred to me, when what does not exist, do the six sense bases not come to be? And by the cessation of what? Does the cessation of the six sense bases come about? Then monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. And when there is no mentality materiality, the six sense bases do not come to be. With the cessation of mentality, materiality comes the cessation of the six sense bases. Then, monks, it occurred to me 
When what does not exist, does mentality materiality not come to be? And by the cessation of what does the cessation of mentality materiality come about? Then monks through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. When there is no consciousness, mentality materiality does not come to be. And with the cessation of consciousness comes the cessation of mentality materiality. And then, monks, it occurred to me, when what does not exist, does consciousness not come to be? And by the cessation of what does the cessation of consciousness come about? Then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom. And when there are no volitional formations or no preparations happening, Consciousness does not come to be. With the cessation of these preparations comes the cessation of consciousness. And then, monks, it occurred to me, when what does not exist, do volitional formations not come to be? And by the cessation of what does the cessation of volitional formations come about? Well, then, monks, through careful attention, there took place in me a breakthrough by wisdom again, when there is no ignorance volitional formations do not come to be. And with the cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of volitional formations. And thus with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of volitional formations or preparations. Cessation of consciousness, cessation of mentality, materiality, cessation of the sixth sense basis, Cessation of contact, cessation of feeling, cessation of craving, cessation of clinging, cessation of habitual tendencies, cessation of birth, cessation of aging and death. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Cessation, cessation. Such is the end of this whole mass of suffering through vision, knowledge, wisdom, true knowledge, and light. Now follows a commentary by Sasana Dipika, Venerable Sister Kima, to review why dependent origination is so important for you. At this point, the Buddha had figured out the nature of the cause of each link of cognition by, by contemplating it in this way, which was a line of dependent co-arising. And he has theoretically deduced how the suffering in each link comes to be and how it ceases. The next step was to formulate for you a way to achieve the cessation of suffering. His job was to find an escape from this line of suffering that he saw. In essence, he has used the Four Noble Truths for the framework of his investigative path. Later on, he would teach others how to do the same kind of investigation following the same line of questions. There is suffering. There is a cause of suffering. There is a cessation of suffering. And after his awakening, he would then devise an organized path that leading to the cessation of suffering. And this is why it becomes so very important to preserve the original meanings for these Four Noble Truths. To change the wording even very slightly can completely change their meaning. And the end result for our meditation today would completely change. Once you've learned each one of the 12 links within the process of human cognition, using simple, clear definitions that fit together nicely, then you will be able to remember them so you can understand what it is that you begin to see as you observe many things happening in life and in meditation. And as you become more tranquil in mind and body during your meditation, your observation will uh, uh, observe more easily arising phenomena in more slow motion, similar to watching the frames of a movie film called 
my life, your life. We usually hear about the birth and the death links as if in relationship to an actual human birth, life and death period. But thinking about the process, life to life, could be considered a macroscopic view and not much pertaining to you and me here and now in this life. This is what we find if we start investigating. Or we could talk about this in a microscopic view and consider the speed of the neurons of my brain firing at extremely fast speeds as events or happenings occur. Although this is more close to the truth of the matter, we still have no hope when we first begin our meditation observation of seeing this process. And again, this doesn't seem to have much to do with yours or my life here and now and our conflicts that we face. However, we could choose to examine these links as they are happening within one life event at a time, at a middle speed, as one person became angry at another, and the opposite person then reacted back, etc. By viewing single events first in our training, we begin to see for ourselves what is going on within this line of human cognition. It's concerning one middle scope of view as we live life day to day. And this might help you to begin to see how war and disputes start. Without knowing this by seeing it now, no person on earth can ever have peace come to be. Individual life events can be watched and studied if we choose a middle way of observing each event process. We can consider how it happens within individual phenomena or events arising in our life first, and then as our observation power gets stronger and we can sit for longer periods, as our mindfulness sharpens and observation gets stronger, we will be able to watch more and more deeply we can perform a phenomenological analysis of how the links happen step by step within one event in life at a time. That's the way Bhante Vimala Ramsey and I taught the dependent origination. To watch the links more closely, one has to have basic understanding of the line of human cognition first, which can begin through any one of your sense doors. The being's basic sense doors are the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body for outside and mind for inside. The first five allow us to experience the external world and the sixth one mind can be observed as an internal world. Each of these sense doors has its own physical earth element, its own functionality and its own field of consciousness leading to contact. To see how this works, let's use the eye for an example. One begins with a working eye. And in the process of cognition, the working eye within the optical system meets something like color and form. Can't hold anything up that you can see. There you go, a pillow, color and form. It's a bell pillow, okay. Eye consciousness arises in the process of your cognition occurs and perception is the process which perceives, names the color and form it meets. If we had one, I could use a red rose. And when you see the red rose, the eye meets color and form, plus eye consciousness arises and the meeting of the three is eye contact. With contact as condition, a feeling comes to be. For the easiest understanding, the Buddha teaches that feeling impersonally arises as pleasant, painful, or neither pleasant or painful. These are the basic pieces you need to understand when you're looking at this subject. 
Now this becomes a routine pattern throughout the suttas. And whenever he refers to how feeling arises within the process of human cognition, the Buddha tells us that there are three kinds of feeling which is complex enough for us to move all the way down the noble path to experience Nibbana. Although other systems such as Abhidhamma label far more kinds of feelings to memorize, this simply is not necessary to go further to complete your investigation and journey to Nibbana within a lifetime. With feeling as condition, craving or tanha comes to be. And craving is traditionally said to be the root cause of suffering. And so it is, somewhat. This craving does give us a warning sign as it is arising. And because of this genuine symptom, the mind can be trained to pick up on this, to detect it. You must just remember that craving always manifests or shows up first as a slight increase in the tension and tightness in mind and body each time it is arising. And within the cycle of your twin practice, that tension and tightness is your cue to never mind this tension as you let it go, relax your mind as you smile and come back to your observation and tasks in life. Now, the nature of this arising situation is that craving is the I like it or I don't like it mind. And at the point of craving, you feel the sudden personal concepts of a personal I suddenly jumping up into the equation of the process of human cognition. This is the first entrance of any obvious personal opinion in the line of cognition. This is where personality, identity, self, or me comes into the picture clearly first. Mind is the forerunner of all states. Mind made are they. You need to remember this. Therefore, mind and the, that tension in the body are connected in a subsystem agreement that in Pali is called Nama Rupa. During cognition, mind translates any sensations in the body to the brain. And the process of perception occurs with the assistance of mind within the play of contact. And it, in this case, we would say red rose. Within the practice of meditation, at the very point where craving is first sparked, a very slight jerking sensation happens for a split second. The moment I enters in, and it can be felt if the tension in your body is lowered enough as the craving tension begins to arise. Mind learns to notice this slight change in tension that happens in the mind and or the body. And it becomes a cue for releasing mind's attention off of any hindrance or distraction that has arisen and pulled your attention away from any object of meditation or from a task that you're doing in your daily life. No different. Now with craving as condition, clinging or upadana arises and clinging is right behind craving. It happens very fast, but they are two links. Clinging become, is the story that runs in your mind about why I like or dislike the feeling. You want to cling to all the ideas, conceptualizations, imaginations, assumptions that one remembers without understanding the true nature of how things work. And this is where judgments, opinions, and all that stuff come in. And it looks like a pulling tension, indicating attachment or an attachment to pushing away, which indicates aversion. Now with clinging as condition, habitual tendencies arise. We wobble about 
uh, deciding whether to label these further as habitual emotional tendencies, uh, because this is just what they are. And this is where disturbing emotions tend to rise up to the surface. However, very precisely habitual, they are habitual and the habitual tendencies are your personal recordings uh, of um, reactions filed in your personal library in your mind, usually from this life, but sometimes they are old fruits of actions from previous lifetimes. These files are unconsciously pulled out by us whenever a re-stimulation happens which can be based on something we saw or heard or smelt or tasted or touched. And these memories bloom into immediate reactions and that we then replay out in all sorts of ways again and again. Habitual tendencies cloud our mind about the present event going on and lead to tightness, tension, suffering, and a kind of internal war within ourselves is played out towards others. There can be no peace. If these tendencies present themselves, but are not identified and not released, with habitual tendencies, this conditioned birth of reaction usually happens. And what is action? Action is karma. Karma just happens in the form of a bodily action, verbal action, or mental action. We are talking about thoughts, words, and deeds here. And this is where the birth of the reactions are acting out spontaneously happen, happening. We do not think about this part because usually we honestly don't know this is happening. Therefore, one reacts instead of responding. And it is interesting that today they say over 80% or more of our life is spent reacting instead of responding until we understand how reactions are actually happening. Only then can this change. We shouldn't feel guilty about this though because no one ever told us about this process of human cognition in any health class in high school, which I find extremely unfair. With birth as condition, aging and death of this event comes to be. This is the end of one event seen through this middle way of observation here and now, while considering the impact of each of the links of impersonal process of dependent origination co-arising. Now the event is over. The event in its totality could bring up sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair during the line of human cognition occurring if we have not stopped the process along the way. How much suffering is directly proportional to how personally we took this event as it occurred? There's more on that a little bit later on. Just now, I took you through what is going on all the time in our experience of life in this existence. We are all the same in this respect. This Human cognition is an impersonal process which we do not personally invite, nor do we personally control the permanent uh, of impermanent factors of this event, the permanence. We don't control the permanence of it. Such events keep running in our lives all the time. And it's like being caught in a movie without knowing that the movie film is made up of frames and the film runs past a very, a light very fast and we do not even know the frames are there. We just see life happening very fast. And this is the cycle going on. So let's recap through it one more time. A sense door leads to contact, then to feeling, craving, clinging, habitual emotional tendencies, birth of reaction, and finally, to aging, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, and the death of that event. 
This cycle runs over and over again and again and again, and the energy of it is turning the wheel of samsara around. Lifetime after lifetime is another larger look at this. Until we begin to know how things work, we continue being trapped on this spinning wheel. Of course, following this, even being within it, there are more complex versions of this cycle running that are revealing many more tiny events within events and more circles within circles going on at unimaginable pace within our brain. The cycles snowball and never seem to slow down until we learn more knowledge and develop wisdom based on the actuality, how things really work. But one of the things the Buddha told us was that it isn't necessary to consider everything. It is only necessary to observe what is needed and do this one thing at a time. To actually see only what is real, to see what is essential as the essential and leave behind the unessential parts of any event becomes a much lighter way of life. Therefore, we, need, don't, we don't need to see every single link in this process to understand how this process works and what could be done to escape it. Mostly, we just need to understand how it works so we don't try to fly blind. The Buddha left us the practice of meditation so that we could learn to observe up close and impersonal process of dependent origination for ourselves. And within his teaching, he taught us 37 requisites of enlightenment to the meditators, which support the development of their practice and gradually come into balance. He left us the four noble truths so we would never forget his own path of investigation and we could repeat it. He taught initially three kinds of feeling needed to recognize and what they mean and five precepts for protection from five hindrances arising to block our progress. He left lessons that identify the nutriment that feeds these hindrances and his personal experience and advice how to overcome them. With these for our support supplies, we could travel down the same path of investigation and experience something very close to his own liberation of mind. To realize this path, we need to follow his instructions first, all the way to the liberation of mind. There will be numerous numbers of mundane and super mundane experiences to help us liberate the mind as we develop. None of this is impossible today. It is simply a matter of looking at the pieces at, in, a, in a particular way where they fit together to see the whole picture and attempting to follow his instructions first before adding in anything else. Having told you about these requisites, we do not have to learn these 37 requisites all at once. They will be gradually uncovered as noted throughout the suttas and the training. We need only to follow the advice of the Buddha in regards to his teaching, as he put it himself. He told us it is a gradual teaching, a gradual practice, a gradual progress, and so it is. And if we are persistent in our practice and consistent with our instructions, we will make pleasant progress in our meditation as a, at a comfortable pace with quick, clear comprehension of the Buddha Dhamma. The Buddha noted to us in the Anguttara Nikaya book of threes, verse 125, he taught a clear basis, a clear set of knowledge and found a clear antidote for suffering. Let's emphasize that a little better. We do not have to complicate our practice by going too fast down the path. We can actually begin practicing quite nicely. 
with a set of very basic foundation information and instructions and move on from there. To impress this fact upon us, the Buddha left us a choice a few choice similes about how much we actually need to learn. Here's one of them. One time when the Buddha was walking along the shore of the Ganges River with the monks, he stooped down and pressed his finger into the sand. He stood up and then He asked them, which is more, all the sands on the bank of this beach or the sand grains on my finger? Well, the monks answered him saying, the sands of the beach, Lord. And then the Buddha said, all the sand on the beach is equal to all that I know. But these grains on the tip of my finger are all that you need to know to become free from suffering in this lifetime. That's pretty amazing. This designates that the Buddha left us what we need for this one lifetime to accomplish the goal he set forth for us. The gift the Buddha left us. He left us a path to the cessation of suffering. The bonus is that while training, our meditation is about the development and the refinement of our behavior, bhavana. It leads us from unwholesome, unhealthy mind states to more wholesome, healthy mind states, and thereby relieving much daily suffering we personally cause ourselves. Our serenity, the samatha, and insight, vipassana, practice incorporates both meditations in one by using an aware form of skilled observation, the sati. With it, we develop a keen observation skill, sati, to see clearly how mind's attention impersonally moves. And watches how everything is working. Then we carry this observation skill out into life with us, use it all the time to live in more peace and harmony. And if we keep this practice going, it will lead us to the various levels of liberation for the mind that are described in the texts. And we listen to them during our Dhamma talks. It will take us, it will, it will take, it will help us to fully opening open and develop mind to the fullest potential if we just follow his instructions to make the most of our practice we must stick to the instructions very closely and if we change the instructions adding or subtracting anything to them without following the guidance of the text we can expect the same results even a very slight subtle change and we risk diluting the relief that we could get. And this contributes to a lack of progress and a completely different end result. We will not be able to attain the final result anymore if we do this. Over the past 22 years, I have been practicing and teaching people how, uh, who teaching people, who often asked me how those original monks developed their practice from the beginning to the end level and how that same progress can be achieved today. I wanted to know this too. And then one day in 2004, my teacher, most venerable Bhante Vimala Ramsi Mahatero, he showed me a sutta that held my answer. And that sutta shows us the Buddha developed a complete development chart that we could use to track our own progress while developing our meditation. And when I came to tell him, I finally completed learning the 12 links of dependent origination. He smiled and handed me a tiny, tiny booklet with this sutta inside it. 
so that I could learn about 24 links instead of the original 12. I was fascinated. He gave me another challenge. And this one sutta gives us a very clear picture of the path of development that can happen for a meditator when they are following his instructions with full understanding. It reveals a clear development chart showing you where you are in your line of development. This development is still possible today. And it's the only way to find out if this is true. The only way to find out if this is true is to check it out for yourselves. So I don't want you to believe me because I'm telling you about this, but now we look directly at the Upanisha Sutta, which is called Proximate Cause. And when we go through this Sutta, it's found on 553 of the Sam Mutant Nikaya, as translated by Bhikkhu Bodhi. At Sawati, monks, I say that the destruction of the taints is for one who knows and sees, not for one who know, does not know and does not see. For one who knows what, for one who sees what, does the destruction of the taints come about? Such is form, the origin of form, such as the past as it's passing away. I'm not sure why this is in space because this was done earlier. Such is form, the origin of form, such as it's passing away, such as feeling, the origin of feeling, such as it's passing away, such as perception, the origin of perception, such as it's passing away, such are karmic kar karma, uh, karma formations, the origin of karma formations, such they're passing away, such as consciousness, such its origin, such it's passing away. It is for one who knows thus, for one who sees thus, that the destruction of the taints or the distractions come about. I say, monks, that the knowledge of the destruction of the distractions has a proximate cause. It does not lack a proximate cause. And what is the proximate cause for the knowledge of destruction of the taints? It should be said, liberation. I say, monks, that liberation too has a proximate cause. It does not lack a proximate cause. And what is the proximate cause for liberation? It should be said dispassion. Now, proximate cause, if you're wondering, this term simply means the preceding cause for the rising of dispassion. That's how you think of it. I say, monks, that dispassion has a proximate cause. It does not lack a proximate cause. And what is the proximate cause of dispassion? It should be said disenchantment. So one is disenchanted before dispassion. I say, monks, that disenchantment too has a proximate cause. It does not lack a proximate cause. And what is the proximate cause for disenchantment? It should be said, knowledge and vision of things as they actually are is that proximate cause. I say, monks, that the knowledge and vision of things as they really are too has a proximate cause. And it does not lack a proximate cause. And what is a proximate cause? for knowledge and vision of things as they really are. It should be said collectedness, profitable level of concentration in your observation, which is your sati. Profitable level means it allows you to see and discover and practice knowledge and vision before attaining knowledge and wisdom. I say, monks, that collectedness too has a proximate cause. It does not lack a proximate cause. What is the proximate cause for? Collectedness. It should be happiness. I say, monks, that happiness has a proximate cause. It does not lack a proximate cause. And what is the proximate cause for happiness? It should be said tranquility. Now, happiness, we always think is of this vibratory nature, 
this vibratory kind of um, uh, frequency. But Buddhist happiness is the contentment of contented happiness where I smile a lot and I smile because this inner happiness is there inside. And tranquility feeds that. That's the cause for this inner happiness to happen. I say, monks, that tranquility has approximate cause, does not lack approximate cause. What is the proximate cause for tranquility? It should be said joy. And this joy is an inner joy that flows inside you. It's not just the uplifted joy in the first jhana, but it's also the joy that's flowing inside of you. And I say, monks, this joy has a proximate cause. It does not lack a proximate cause. What is the proximate cause of the joy? It is said, it should be said, uh, relief. And relief, the word is pamoja, we use uh, for this, relief. And I say, monks, that gladness is, oh, oh we said, I'm sorry, we should say relief there, relief. We changed it to relief because honestly, relief is really what happens to you the first time you sit down and you start practicing, you experience this, this relief that's uncanny. You know, and so um, Pamoja is the is the poly word for that. And relief is a pretty good definition of this. I say monks that relief has approximate cause. It does not lack approximate cause. And what is the cause for this relief? It should be said mindfulness. And now this mindfulness is the correct kind of watching, impersonal, no personal judgment, just witnessing is the best word that seems to get us there witnessing what is going on as it's developing. No opinions, no involvement, no investigation or analyzing of it. Just mindfulness is that kind of um, witnessing. I say that mindfulness too has approximate cause. It does not lack approximate cause. What is the approximate cause for mindfulness? It should be said faith. And faith, this kind of faith is just when you decide to really examine what the Buddha did and what he found, and is it there, and can you do it again, and will it help me? It's a good idea to put your faith in what you're doing and put your faith in the, in the fact that he probably did find something significant, and that's what you're looking for, to understand what that is. So you put your faith in the teacher and in the in the in the Buddha and the Buddha Dhamma, very closely faith in that, and then try to follow it as close as possible. I see monks that faith too has approximate cause. It does not lack approximate cause. What is the approximate cause for faith? Your suffering. Your suffering, and you cannot find an answer. And when you cannot find a, a, a any sen sensible reason or explanation for the suffering that you feel, time to put your faith in the system and then give it a whirl and give some time to it and see if you can find an answer through it. And I say to you, suffering has a proximate cause. And what is its proximate cause? It is birth. The birth of the reactions that you have gone through, the birth of the problems you feel that have been coming down on top of you. These are the things we're talking about. And what is the birth? That birth too has the proximate cause. What is that cause? Your habitual tendencies of reacting, the habitual tendencies to react. And what is the support for the habitual tendencies? It should be said that clinging is the, the driving force the stories that run in your mind about why you don't like something or you want something and you're trying to make, get attached to it or have aversion towards it. That's the clinging. And what is the support for the clinging is the craving that happens first, the I don't like it. And then from there. And the craving, the craving. I said craving too has approximate cause. And what is that happens since happens before the craving we heard before was feeling. And feeling has approximate cause. And what is approximate cause for that feel for that uh, for that uh, feeling is contact. And what does contact have as approximate cause? Those six operating sense doors, which you don't really control. You do not tell yourself what to see, hear, smell, taste, touch. 
that's operating. And then the sixth sense basis has approximate cause. And that is the mentality, materiality of the physical body. The anatomy of your body is set up with these sense doors as part of the structure of the anatomy of your body. And they have a material existence based on the elements. And then it has the mental structure in the brain connected to these sense doors for them to operate. And then what is the support for the mentality materiality has approximate cause. Well, it should be said consciousness because without consciousness, nothing can be cognized. Nothing can be cognized, yeah? And so that consciousness has a uh, approximate cause and that are the formations that happened before. And I'm gonna change these and say preparations here to the chagrin, I guess, of some people. But that's what we see happening. <laughs> Thus monks with ignorance as the proximate cause. Preparations come to being with preparations as proximate cause. Look at that, we go again there. Huh? with con consciousness as proximate cause, consciousness with consciousness as proximate cause, name and form with name and form as proximate cause, the sixth sense door basis with the sixth sense door basis as proximate cause, contact with contact as approximate cause, feeling with feeling as proximate cause, craving with craving as proximate cause, clinging with clinging as proximate cause, habitual tendencies with habitual tendencies as proximate cause, birth and with birth as proximate cause, suffering. Now here is where the sutta shifts away from the normal string of just the dependent origination into a transcendental reflection that gives us a development chart to follow so we can transcend suffering. That's why. It's important because with suffering as a proximate cause, faith will help us. And with faith as a proximate cause for the practice, we will find relief as we practice. And with relief as proximate cause, joy will arise. And with joy as proximate cause, when it fades away, tranquility will arise. And with tranquility as proximate cause, happiness. And with happiness as proximate cause, collection of mind, uh, collectedness of mind, the, the right balance of concentration will come up with collectedness of mind as proximate cause, knowledge and vision of things as they really are, with knowledge and vision of things as they really are as proximate cause, disenchantment, with disenchantment as proximate cause, then eventually dispassion, the mind will not be disturbed by anything happening, whether it is to moving towards attachment or moving towards aversion. It will not disturb the mind. With dispassion as proximate cause, liberation occurs. And with liberation as proximate cause, the knowledge of the destruction of the taints, or you can say of the distractions, Just as, how does it happen? Now he tells you in this the sutta, the Buddha tells you, how does it happen? Just as monks, when rain pours down in thick droplets on a mountain top, the water flows down along the slopes and fills the cleft, gullies and creeks. And these being full, fill up the pools and these being full, fill up the lakes. And these being full will fill up the streams. And these being full fill up the rivers. And these being full fill up the great ocean. This is how it all builds up and connects together for you to understand how it works and begins to operate. 
so too with ignorance as proximate cause, volitional formations come to be, and with volitional formations as proximate cause, consciousness comes to be. With consciousness as proximate cause, mentality, materiality come to be. With mentality, materiality as proximate cause, the sixth sense doors come to be. With the sixth sense door bases as proximate cause, contact comes to be. With contact as proximate cause, feeling comes to be. With feeling as proximate cause, craving comes to be. With craving as proximate cause, clinging comes to be. And with clinging as proximate cause, habitual tendencies come to be. And with ten habitual tendencies as proximate cause, birth will come to be. And with birth as proximate cause, suffering comes to be. Now with suffering as pro proximate cause, faith comes to be. And with faith as proximate cause, relief comes to be. With relief as proximate cause, joy comes to be. And with joy as pro, uh, mm -hmm. let's say come to be with, with joy as proximate cause, tranquility comes to be. With tranquility as proximate cause, happiness comes to be. With happiness as proximate cause, concentration or collectedness comes to be. With collectedness as proximate cause, knowledge and vision of how things really are comes to be. And with the knowledge and vision of things as they really are, as proximate cause, disenchantment comes to be. With disenchantment as proximate cause, dispassion comes to be. With dispassion as proximate cause, liberation comes to be. With liberation as proximate cause, the knowledge of the destruction of the taints comes to be. In conclusion, there are a few questions, but I think I want to come out to you guys first and see um, what you have to tell me as far as a question or so. So let me pop out for a minute and ask you if you're getting it. <laughs> and hopefully you were scribbling it as it was happening. Or hopefully you've got a copy of this. And there were some mistakes in this and I thought we had this all straightened out. I'm not sure if I sent the same one to you, but I'm hoping I did. There were two copies running around here. <laughs> Hi, you, how are you? Your mic, you need to turn your mic on. Turn your mic on. Yeah, good. <laughs> Hello, sister. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, that was that's a, a great combination of uh, uh, two sitters. I've got um, a couple of questions which I think are linked. In the first one, uh, we were talking about um, before, before the Enlightenment um right. it was a breakthrough by wisdom now in your opinion is that wisdom and intellectual yeah. what, uh, analysis well, or was yeah. this or I was this I talked about this more in there but... mm. okay he was contemplating he wasn't meditating he was contemplating and putting it together. And then he may have meditated individual ones here and there, but he wasn't seeing it is what I'm trying to get across to you. He, when you look at these and you read them, you begin to understand he was not seeing these. He was discovering by neti neti. He was doing a system, a system of um, deductive reasoning in order to analyze one at a time, you see? Okay. And that's yeah. yeah. The reason I point it out is because some traditions, some traditions just ignore this sutta completely and say no. After he was awakened, he walked around for seven days, and that's when he put all this together. But that's not true because of the suttas that keep saying 
this is a bodhisattva uh, enterprise here. <laughs> this is the bodhisattva doing this contemplation work and this research work first and having this idea. Then we feel that what happened was when he lightened up on the practice and went in uh, and changed it, which is mentioned in 36 in section 30 approximately, um, you get the understanding something significant changed after he starved himself and then he just makes a decision, you know, this is, this is all this torture is wrong. Uh, I need to feed myself, take a bath, get strong, make a hit, a, a, a make a, a, an attempt again uh, with a whole body and sleep and everything. And the others, they abandon him and that's when he goes through. So what did he change and how did he get through is sort of revealed in 36, like we discussed, I think, before. Okay, but then he probably went through to see, see these, how this was working. When he went all the way through, he probably saw the links and then it made sense to him because he'd done this deductive reasoning with it before. Yeah. Okay, so then that, I think that possibly answers my second question, which is, what then makes it transcendent, transcendent then dependent origination is the is the faith that he felt or the confidence that he felt um, at directly experiencing what he had deducted. Yeah, and I should have gone the rest of the way. Shall I go back in and go the rest of the way? Because <laughs> because um, a couple of this stuff, stuff was written in there, and there was a tiny piece I wrote at the end that sort of sum up this thing. So I maybe should go back in and keep going a little bit because you're at, you're almost hitting on what those questions were. Is there another angle question or you wanna, because that one can be answered, I'm sure. Okay, okay. Yeah, All right, let's yeah, go just, back in for a minute. It's okay, go into again, okay. Okay. Um, so in conclusion, there turned out to be a few questions that's, that people had asked when I first put this together back in 2013. Can we rise above ignorance? The answer is yes, we can. There is an escape. The ignorance was about not understanding how things work, to be precise. And the Buddhist teaching revealed this for us. And by seeing, um, by seeing uh, for ourselves how the process works, um, of the human cognition, okay, we realize the purpose of the teaching of anatta, the impersonal nature of our experience, and we then uh, leave ignorance behind. Once we gain a knowledge of how to escape from suffering, then one makes an effort to get totally free from it, but one won't make an effort to get totally free of it because don't, don't believe it's possible and we've had too much knowledge kept away from us. We only have to taste this freedom to know that it is possible, and then we will investigate further. Do we have a choice at some point to suffer or not to suffer? Now, this is, yes, we do. Every step of the way, this is what volition means, choice, and it becomes your choice to crave and cling uh, to suffering or not once you understand how it's working from the atta, the, the personal thing side of things. And it is possible to see what the Buddha did during the practice of his own meditation by repeating it. As you, one begins to notice arising symptoms of craving, the change in the tension in the body and mind, then you can train the mind to take this as a signal to practice right effort, the steps that you're taught in TWIM. And we begin to let go, relax, smile, and come back. And in so doing, we are canceling uh, the cause of suffering, and we are replacing it each time. So this is what purifies and retrains the mind, these two, the, these four steps, and changes the patterns of the behavior. So the note that Bhikkhu Bodhi said about what we just went through um, is that um, uh, he says, I have always especially in, been intrigued by the fact, okay, by the fact uh, that by joining the two strings together, the mundane with the transcendental, it demonstrates that the two dimensions of human existence, the mundane and the transcendental, the dimensions of world involvement and world disengagement are both governed by a single structural prin principle, that of dependent co-arising. So my advice to people is really to take this uh, the chart and that you're looking for 
an estimate uh, of how well you're doing along your meditation path, it's a good idea to keep the development chart somewhere so that you can occasionally glance at it um, as you go along in your practice, at least once or twice a week to see for yourself where you are and it should contribute to further understanding. Now, what I added down here was this little article I don't know how little, but I think it's little. How does suffering slow down and stop? Ah, crap. I don't know what I just did. I don't know what I just did. I don't know what I just did. Crown, I don't know where I am. I love this. It's okay, we can, we can see your article on the screen. You can see it still? Yep. You can. You can. Okay, so I just created an extra document. I'm sorry. Okay, got it. One thing is for certain. Um, okay, well, this how we can. How does suffering slow down and 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 stop um, by using the knowledge of dependent origination and applying it during your everyday life? People are always asking me how this is. I have students now who are just running out of here after three weeks of you know, me talking to them every day and they're doing it in life all day long and they're having so much fun. They're going nuts. They're having so much fun doing this, you know. But one thing is for certain, mind can learn. It is remarkable. It is retrainable. When mind begins to recognize the warning signs of arising suffering, you can learn to let go of the heat of the suffering earlier, little by little. But only if you learn this knowledge that we're talking about first, it's worth the time to really get down and try to um, learn it and remember it in your own way, you know? So by understanding and applying, what well, we learn from the links of the impersonal process of dependent origination and knowing the symptom of arising craving, which is the genius of this whole thing, that there was this, this arising craving had a symptom that's obvious. We're able to observe with understanding how suffering works and then use a routine escape plan in daily life situations the Buddha left us. And although we might not escape permanently, there is no question that with each experience of letting go, our brain is learning and it's beginning to alter our perspective and feel some temporary escape and relief from the suffering right then and there. So by learning about human cognition, we figure out that we can change. And this is significant in the last 12 or 15 years. Before that, they didn't believe we could change. They thought it would take you the rest of your life with a psychiatrist or psych psychoanalyst to change. But now we know you can change by, uh, you know, we can heal inside by observing how things actually work. And, and there during our daily life, we can witness how suffering begins in the deeper sense by noticing the first arising signs during meditation. Mind learns to take this cue to let go of such arising symptoms. So you don't necessarily stop suffering by forcing craving to stop. That's, that's an illusion that somebody started from people who wanted the immediate gratification solution for everything just like that. It doesn't work. That's not it. It doesn't happen that way. That can only be temporary. Real change occurs naturally through repetitive practice of twim, the right effort. With sharp observation, mindfulness reveals how the suffering works. And gradually, you reduce a little bit at a time by eliminating the links um, from the end result backwards. So let me show you. Suffering diminishes step by step because we don't go quite so far down the line in sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. We realize the consequences when we do things. Suffering diminishes more permanently when you begin to eliminate the birth of reaction from the end of the line. And in a situation of anger between two people, for instance, you might stop striking back mentally, verbally, and physically at what you don't like, and that's the first step. Perhaps you saw or heard something that made you a painful feeling come up, and usually you would jump into reaction about without knowledge. That's careless, habitual reaction. But if you don't try, but if you don't strike back, then 
the birth of reaction doesn't happen and then less suffering follows than before. And there is less heat now in the events. So using volition, which is your choice, you choose to replace your usual reaction with something else. Now you've replaced it. Mindfulness helps you to remember the knowledge and wisdom that leads you to respond instead with some compassion and then apply loving kindness. Now it's true, you have to understand what compassion means. It means pause and give the person some space that's yelling at you and don't take it personally. Just listen, just let, let it flow and don't take it personally. That takes practice, it's hard. But then you, you, you let, everybody has this problem and at some point, and then you give back loving kindness by forgiving and giving the space and loving kindness is go get coffee, have hot chocolate or something. The next time something similar happens, you stop just before the usual outburst and you notice how mind pulls up the same idea from your memory again. And it's the same kind of stimulus as before, but this time you let go of reacting that way and you close down your habitual tendency library. You, you realize you had this library and this library is interesting because once you realize that some people really get mad, <laughs> you know, they get mad. They had this, this habitual tendency library. I, you know, it's there and you decide to close the door. I am not going to live by just reacting from what happened 20 years ago again and again and again to everything I deal with. There have been people like that I've taught. So now there is no set plan for the birth of reaction to happen. Instead of thinking about revenge from the past on the spot, you stop there and your page jumps up. <laughs> you smile that you caught yourself. You're beginning to see that the event more impersonally, you're beginning to watch it. And now your interest shifts to how it repeats in the same way over and over again. And you see how this is happening. And so you let it fall back into the past where it belongs. And you move on in life with a more upward trend in your mind. You make a decision. You're taking charge. This is an opportunity for the person to actually take a charge. For some reason, we've gotten to a place where, yeah, you're a victim too, and nobody can be in charge, so don't feel bad. And I disagree with that. Later on, when a similar event occurs, you remember how this process worked. And now you remember that you stopped the angry story running in your mind about why I don't like what's going on. So you realize that this story from the past was the clinging link popping up. And you realize it's an old story from the past or just a concept or an idea, even imagination. It can even be your own imagination, which is this mental proliferation pumps, keeps it going. And you realize it came up suddenly without you asking it to. So you let it go. You smile. You step back a little more and you see the event more clearly as just what is essential. it essentially is, an impersonal process that's going on. This is where we're trying to get you to watch your movie. Watch your movie as if you are in command of the editing room. That's what we're trying to show you. We're trying to show you that you can be the editor of your own movie. And so now you decide to let go of these ongoing thoughts, stories, and concepts, ideas, even imagination, and decide that if this happens again, you won't dive into them. Instead, you're going to see more clearly what essentially is really happening in the event. That old stuff that popped up into mind before was unessential. And and it has nothing to do with what is going on now in this present time. 85% of the time, this is true. Now, things begin to change a little more now because the next time, the next time you are all the way back where you're paying attention to this, you're going to sense the shift in tension and tightness in your mind and in your body that happens as craving begins to arise. Catching this symptom early, you now let go of it. You're actually letting go of the I in I don't like it mind. You might laugh at this. You suddenly realize, hey, this feeling is just a feeling. It's a, it arises, it's there, and it passes away. It's impersonal and impermanent. Look at that. And guess what? You just saw, Anisha, the impermanence happening for real. 
right there. You are on your way to um, new possibilities. You have discovered the, the benefit of thinking, never mind, as you let go of the past over and over again, you are learning to never mind it and just let it be where it belongs in the past timeline. You let this go. Now you begin to see only what is essential. You're moving into the here and now zone. And now you notice that there seems to be more space in your mind so that as you respond, instead of reacting, you might actually come up with some new, more creative, peaceful solutions for whatever's happening in life situations. My students do it all the time. You have begun the process of real change. Congratulations, your perspective of life and seeing this impersonal nature of your experience in this existence has truly begun. And now everything begins to feel a lot lighter than before. It's time for a smile. That is how you and me can use dependent origination here and now in the life to change the outcome of the interactions in life. And as, as, um, as we begin to live this practice of TWIM, it feels good because others around us are beginning to smile too. The frequency is coming off of us. It's coming off of us. As we're shining, they start picking up these vibrations. Now it's time to smile at your accomplishment. Now it's time to move on in life. This is, this is what... Um, you know, this, this is frustrating. One of the reasons it was never printed was because I could never get this kind of in the right, <laughs> the right spot. So I went ahead and tried to do it again last night. But you see, so this whole thing about the dependent origination, you use it, but how you, how you actually heal is from the end of it backwards. And the, uh, the, what do you transcend? Well, what did you just transcend? You transcended pain, you transcended grief, you, you transcended the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And the grief and despair was the mental pain, you see? You transcended it because you started to laugh at it. You can't transcend it. You know, it takes years and years. You can finally get there, but you've years and years and years if you're only not gonna do it anymore. Because it's the little people, it's all their fault. <laughs> <laughs> they're up in the in the clouds and they're keeping the books on everybody it's my irish background coming up again and these little people are all up there and they're just saying oh my gosh look at that he didn't do that but he's done it for 35 years well what is the supervisor going to say if i try to write the book for this person what happened to them today but he doesn't you know what am i going to do when he doesn't do it but then i'm sure he's going to do it again because we, what do we do he didn't put anything in place of it you know what they don't like it the universal law says it will not accept a vacuum. It will not accept a hole. Something has to go in it. And that's why we keep falling back to doing it again and again and again. And it's not profitable for us, you know? So what's the question now? <laughs> Did I hit it? Did I find it? <laughs> Did I find it okay? <laughs> Yeah, that, yeah, that's nice. I've, I've got one more question about something else you were mentioning um, in your talk. And you describe about this um, subtle little jump when craving arises in the mind. Yeah. Uh, but I'm also aware that as soon as you become aware that your mind is no longer on your object of meditation, often that's a, accompanied by another jump in the mind and it's like a, a jump and it feels to me like that is a recognition in the mind or that's a reality in the mind of of letting go of attachment so the mindfulness has brought you back into the present you you've come away from being caught up and it's like it's a release of tension and coming back into balance and so there seems to be if you like a jerk on in both from a practical point of view uh, and often if you've missed the first one which you would normally which you release around you see the second one very clearly. I see what you're saying. Yeah, okay. Yeah, if you're getting two little places there where you can feel that, you just let go of it because those jerks are pushing you a little bit faster into, and see, the thing is that it's actually the feelings moving into craving. And then um, when I comes up is the first 
really one that you see, I don't like this, yeah. you say I, and then you, you've seen how I've given you the, uh, the um, simile of the car before with the, with the different gears in a stick shift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can remember my father screaming, you know, first gear, you don't drive around in it. You just put it in first gear to get the thing rolling. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd say, get your foot off the gas now, put the clutch down and get in second gear. And and second gear, you know, is um we we did it, how did we say? Uh putting the key in is feeling is feeling, no, is contact. Putting the key in is contact. And then when you do first gear, that's feeling. And when you move into I don't like this, that is second gear. And clinging is third gear. And then pushing through the habitual tendency real fast towards the birth of reaction down the ramp is your fourth year going down on the highway. Yeah, and it's pushing, 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 pushing. Each one of those is harder. So, yeah. but listening, then, listening to the, yeah, listening to those guys come to me and say how they ended their anger thing was interesting because they're describing it specifically when they examined it, we're, we're giving it up from back here. We're not trying to stop it here. We're mm. just surrendering and we're gonna see what happens if we just stop giving the birth of reaction. And then we, we see the repetition of what we're doing clearly and we close the library and then we give up the story about why we don't like it. And then there we sit with craving. Now we're going to be stuck with craving till we're, you know, they'll say until you're an arahat, okay. But sometimes you can get rid of it, give it up in what's going on. Sometimes you can, sure. Well, it, it seems to me like the, the, uh, the, when your mindfulness kicks in again and you recognize your mind has moved off the object of attention, that's like you have pushed that driving, that fourth gear, into neutral it's that moment where the driving stops and that's also a physical set it's like a physical sensation in the body and the mind when that happens yeah, you can just do it a few times but to when we have them dedicate themselves to completely abolishing um in anger management we have them completely making a decision to work to completely abolish it we have to um look at the benefit of going from just don't ever have the birth of it anymore and start laughing instead replace it with laughing we you can't laugh and be angry at the same time it's impossible it's impossible so you have to start laughing even if you have to leave the room if the person's inciting you you know even if you go i can't believe i'm getting stuck excuse me <laughs> you know and you go out of the room you have to just start laughing and you're immediately giving up the anger see and then yeah. and then you're you 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 notice what you were going to throw back and it's a repetition of what you kept in your little diary and you what you kept in this little book was what exactly did i throw to people today how many times did i throw the same thing at another person and you find out oh my gosh it's coming out of the library just like she says i don't want this library in my mind that's stupid you know, you know, only some jerk would keep living out of the same library again and again and again. And they, they want to close it. And that's what they said. And then they came back and they said, and then we saw this, this thing because you you read us uh, Mad, Madhupandika Sutta and reading Madhupandika Sutta is good, you know, because um, because you read to them 38 when you first teach dependent origination and you get them to do the responses with you so they're getting used to it, then you can use 18, uh, use some, um, what is it, A 18 as the second way of showing them how this works. And you're giving them an example of clinging as being mental proliferation. And then they start watching for that. And then they see this mental proliferation story going, jap, 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 you know, yak, 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 yak in your head. And then they'll go for stopping that story running in their head about all the reasons why they don't like something. And then they'll go back one more and say, how did this, where did this start? And they'll begin to see if they didn't feel it. And you know, there's different people come to you and, and, to, and when you're teaching, you know, there are different people who are gonna come to you and some are just coming to have relief and calmness. And they don't care about all the rest of this whole thing. And that other people will come out of a, a tradition like Goenka where they've been hyper hypersensitive to going to everything that happens in their body 
and they're sensitive to seeing, uh, feel, sensing, sensing, very sensing the of what's happening in their body. And so they can actually be the fastest ones to progress if they just see where it's happening in the body or in and then and then watch how it happened in the mind before the body connection and then they'll start letting go faster than anybody else and i'm fascinated with that so rather than say anything about the time you spent with vipassana only for heaven's sakes come on over and see what happens with this practice because you can very quickly be letting go relax smile come back very much quicker than other people when i tell you that the symptom of the craving is the change in your tension and tightness anywhere in your body or your mind and then let go relax smile come back yeah. And keep smiling. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah. Anybody else want to throw up a question about this monster that we did today? <laughs> you know, I hope all of you liked it. I hope all of you, um, yeah, Bonte, how are you doing? <laughs> you have one? <laughs> No, no, I just, uh, I thought we are over now. Uh, there are no questions. Probably it's a good idea. <laughs> it's a good idea. Yeah, I, I was ready to take this off. <laughs> yeah, I can only keep it on so, so long, but apparently yeah. the muscles up here, if I tip my head forward, the head is the heaviest part of your body, the heaviest organ in your body. And if you've strained the muscles that hold it up, if you lean over, it's heavier than if you keep it up straight. Mm -hmm. So now everything's propped up <laughs> on books, trying to get a better angle. <laughs> it's, just the, it's just part of the territory right now. Mm -hmm. So let me do the prayer and we'll let everybody go. May suffering May once be suffering, suffering free suffering and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving may shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.